I'm standing right here on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, one of the most famous bodies of water in all the world. It's right here where Jesus came to be with his friends, to teach lessons about life, and maybe to just enjoy the beauty of this marvelous place. But obviously Jesus came here with a much greater purpose in mind that would change the lives of countless millions of souls around the world and throughout time right here on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a beautiful sea that often reflects the golden rays of the early morning sun darting across its calm, colorful waters. Lying 690 feet below sea level, the sea stands at center stage in this coliseum of hills, often adorned with gentle white caps and tints of hue and gray. The beauty of this place, however, extends far beyond what we see here today to a time when Jesus of Nazareth graced its beauty in his own way with his powerful lessons and his works of love. The Sea of Galilee is a beautiful sea. Um, it's very difficult in some cases to see all the way across. Um, if you've ever been to Lake Tahoe, I, it reminds me of Lake Tahoe in the sense that it's beautiful crystal water, um, but it's a massive lake. Um, uh, we refer to it as a sea, but it's, it's more of a, a really a lake. Uh, fed by really the the Upper Jordan, of course, the waters that 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 are that melt from Mount Hermon, uh, but it's a beautiful place. Located in the Rift Valley between the steep hills of Lower Galilee on the west and the hills of Bashan on the east, the Sea of Galilee has some 33 miles of shoreline and is shaped much like a, a musical lyre. Its waters come from not only the runoff of rainfall in the area but also from the refreshing waters of the Jordan River to the north and from several springs found around and under the lake. Referred to only four times in the Old Testament, the Sea of Galilee is known as the Sea of Chinnereth, but in the New Testament as either Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, or some 31 times simply as the Sea. This western side of this 13 by seven and a half mile lake is located on a branch of the International Highway with cities like Magdala, Chinnereth, Capernaum, and Bethsaida lining its path. While each of these cities were important places in the ministry of Jesus, Capernaum was especially important because according to Matthew 4:13, this was the place where Jesus made his home during his public ministry. It was also the administrative center of the region and was an important trade city along the international north-south trade route. To this day, the remains of many different millstones and public buildings can be found here, a testimony to the commerce and trade practice at this busy location during New Testament times. Somewhere by this 64 square mile lake and just outside of this important city of Capernaum, Jesus taught other lessons as well. Lessons that were not merely heard, but witnessed by others through the various miracles he performed. These miracles not only testified to his deity, but gave him opportunity to demonstrate his compassion toward others as well. It was somewhere near Capernaum that he healed a man of the horrible disease of leprosy. The Bible also says that when Jesus was entering into Capernaum, that he was met with a request by a Roman centurion whose servant was grievously sick and he wanted Jesus to heal him. We don't know exactly where that story took place, but it could have been right here at the entrance of the ancient city of Capernaum. Somewhere in the vicinity of this lakeside town, Jesus, by the mere power of his word, healed the centurion's servant by saying to him, as you have believed, so be it done unto you. 
It was also somewhere near this place that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. Is this Peter's house seen beneath the chapel of this Franciscan monastery? We have no way of knowing for certain, but we do know, based on what was discovered here, that there was once in existence at this place a home from the first century that had been used for Christian gatherings. Capernaum, then, is a very special place rich in terms of its location and its archaeological remains. Jesus performed uh, a number of miracles in Capernaum, and it including helping people who were demon-possessed. And that's something we find in Mark chapter 1. And it seems to have been his practice to heal people with physical infirmities. We find that in Mark chapter 2. And the latter is a famous case where so many people want to hear Jesus that four friends tear a hole in the roof of the building where Jesus is to lower their friend down so that he can be healed. Now, these kinds of miracles did three things. They showed his love and concern for his people. They demonstrated his power as the Son of God. And then they confirmed the authority behind his teaching. As one makes his or her way through the ancient homes of Capernaum, the remains of a synagogue of the Jews is easily in view. Though not the ruins of the actual synagogue visited by Jesus, it is a synagogue built on top of the foundation that was in existence during the time of Christ. The remains of that first century synagogue can still be seen in the visible basalt foundation, a type of volcanic rock used for building projects during the time of Christ. The present synagogue, built sometime around the fourth century AD, is of great importance because it gives us an excellent idea of the design and layout of an ancient house of worship utilized by the Jews. Its floor plan, though larger in size, is similar to the one recently discovered near modern Migdal and now identified as a first century synagogue in the ancient fishing town of Magdala. Since the Gospel of Matthew records that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, it is almost certain that Jesus walked in this place and taught from this Torah reading table, now known as the Magdala Stone. The word synagogue basically means a, a gathering place. They were places where the Jews could gather, study, learn, pray, worship. Certainly by the time of the New Testament, synagogues were found throughout Israel and in various Middle Eastern cities where the Jews resided outside of Palestine. Similar in design to the synagogue built at Torazin, just a few miles to the north, the synagogue at Capernaum is different with imported white limestone used in its construction and elaborate artwork inscribed on its columns and remains. Notice the vine and fig leaves, geometric designs. A fourth century Aramaic inscription on one of the broken column reads the name of the donor. These names in the Greek form Alpheus and Zebedee are mentioned in the New Testament. One of the carvings of a cart may depict a portable Ark of the Covenant. Also, among the decorations is a common geometric design of the ancient world symbolizing fruitfulness. Imagine Jesus coming into the synagogue that once stood in this place. And as he came into this synagogue, healing a man's hand that had been withered, or casting out that demon out of a man who had been tormented by the powers of Satan. Imagine also Jesus telling others about the love of God and preaching to them out of the Torah. Imagine Jesus reminding them that he had not only the power to heal, but also to forgive. Oh, the joy that must have been experienced by those so afflicted by life's sorrows. As I sit in this ancient synagogue, I can't help but reflect upon what it would have been like to be present when Jesus was preaching. How would I have responded? How would I have changed my life to become more like His? While walking along this hallowed ground, I have to wonder what else took place here. Did He perform miracles here other than those specifically mentioned in the Bible? The Bible records nowhere near all of the miracles that Jesus performed. In John 21, he tells us that if all of the miracles of Jesus were written in detail, 
I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Of course, Jesus did many, many miracles that are not recorded in the New Testament, but the ones that are recorded are recorded to create faith, that we can have confidence that Jesus is the Son of God, which is proven by His miracles, and that He can keep the promises that He's made to us. Indeed, Jesus was truly a great miracle worker who came to the synagogue to worship and to read and study the Torah and to minister to others. But his work would also take him into other places outside of this synagogue and out onto the beautiful Sea of Galilee where his disciples learned some very important lessons and where he performed some amazing miracles. Not only did Jesus perform miracles near the sea, but Jesus also demonstrated his power on the sea. In fact, it was on one occasion while the disciples were struggling to maintain the safety of their boat that Jesus came walking on these waters. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that the disciples of the Lord were in a boat at night headed to the other side when halfway across they encountered heavy winds and high waves. Having gone up to the mountain to pray, Jesus now appeared to them, walking on the water. Frightened by what they were seeing, Jesus said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. It was then that Peter asked, Lord, if it's really you, let me come into you. So he allowed him to get out of the boat. But as Peter saw the waves crashing around him, he began to sink. He cried out unto the Lord. And it was then that Jesus said, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Imagine Peter walking to Jesus and then feeling himself begin to sink into the 141 feet abyss of the lake. In the midst of his fear, it was then that Jesus rescued him. Of the many miracles that Jesus performed on and around the Sea of Galilee, you see these great stories, these great miracles that demonstrate his power over the known universe. You certainly recall the calming of the storm as the disciples on the boat were in a pure panic. And Jesus, of course, demonstrates his power over nature by calming the seas of which he was the author. That story may very well have begun here, where thousands could have gathered in this natural made amphitheater known today as the Cove of the Sower, a place that no matter where you may have been seated, you could have easily heard the voice of Jesus as his melodic message was wafted by the breeze from the Sea of Galilee up through this conical-shaped area. From there, the Lord and his disciples set sail across the nearly seven-mile trip to the region of the Gadarenes. Sailing across the sea could at times be dangerous due to the sudden storms that could arise because of the geographic features inherent in the land. To the north, Rising to the heights of 9,230 feet above sea level lay the great Mount Hermon, whose winds would at times descend from its peak and be forced down into the tunnel-like trough of the Jordan Rift Valley. Sometimes the winds would come bursting out upon the water surface and capture a helpless small fishing vessel in a maelstrom of whitecaps. Fishing vessels used on this lake during the first century were most likely not much longer than this reconstructed fishing boat located near present-day En Gev. The boat boarded by Jesus the night of the storm may actually have been similar to a first century boat discovered in 1986 during a severe drought in the mud near the shoreline of the ancient city of Magdala. As the waters receded, parts of this 27 foot long by seven and a half foot wide vessel became visible and was excavated and brought to the Gale Alon Museum in Guinnessar. The Jesus boat has a fascinating story. It was discovered by accident during a drought in 1986 when the water level of the Sea of Galilee receded enough to expose the boat. Now, it's a good first century example of what Jesus and his followers would have used in their travels. Uh, in his writings, Josephus indicates that as many as 15 men could have fit into a boat like this, but it wouldn't have provided much protection during a storm like the ones we read about in the Gospels. Just imagine how they must have felt in such a small boat, 
struggling to maneuver through the crashing waves, petrified as they watched their boat fill with water and felt themselves beginning to sink into the darkness of the storm. In their desperation, they questioned the Lord's care and concern for them, asking, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? It was, however, in the midst of that furious storm that the disciples, like never before, began to see Jesus as more than just some great teacher. They began to see him as a great miracle worker, as the Son of God. Just hours before, in that same boat, Jesus was teaching them about the importance of having a receptive heart. But now his words taught them that he had power over heaven and earth, and that with his words, he could calm the storms by simply saying, peace, be still. Following the calming of the storm, the disciples found themselves safely reaching their destination on the other side of the lake, where they were met by an unusual sight, a scar-ridden, clothes-less man who was being tormented by some unclean spirit. On the eastern side of this lake, Jesus and his disciples met this tortured man who was longing to be free of his demons. From a wild storm to a wild man here at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus revealed that the lives of men are sacred and not to be overwhelmed by the powers of nature or Satan. Whenever I'm near a lake similar to the Sea of Galilee, I can't help but think about all that it does to sustain the cycle of life, to quench our thirst, to satisfy our hunger, and to lure us with its beauty. But also, when I'm at the water's edge, I tend to think a lot about Jesus, His miracles, and His message of salvation. Because of all that the Lord did and said in Galilee, you and I today can have confidence in knowing that the same powerful words uttered here can likewise today calm the storms of marital conflict, financial ruin, or personal tragedy. Whenever something endangers us, seeks to control us, or threatens to sink our boat, we must learn to rely on Jesus, reach out to Him in faith, and trust in His powerful words. Words, while uttered some 2,000 years ago, are just as powerful today as they were the day He uttered them out on that tumultuous lake in the region of Galilee. But finally, not only did the words of Jesus calm the storm, it also compelled a small band of men to leave their livelihoods and begin a new work of fishing for men. The power of Jesus is seen not only in His ability to calm the storm or to walk on water, but also in the miracle of the catch of fish in Luke chapter 5. And Jesus, right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, tells them to put out in deep water and to let their nets down. They pulled in a catch of fish so big, it started to sink their boats. After this, Jesus says, Come, and I'll make you fishers of men. Those men who had witnessed how the winds and the sea obeyed Jesus were likewise compelled to obey His words and cast aside their nets and begin a new work of evangelism. May each of us today be enthralled by the awesome power displayed by Jesus at Galilee, and may each of us dedicate our lives to following and obeying the great miracle worker of Nazareth and the one who calms the sea. And may we likewise today become fishers of men, pointing others to the beautiful Lamb of God. You are the canyon and I am a crevice. You are the heavens and I am I absolutely love being at the Sea of Galilee. There's a, a natural beauty associated with that place. It sits some 600 feet below sea level, nestled among several graceful hills and unique geographical formations that give it a sort of Colosseum effect. And on the southwestern side, there is this majestic looking escarpment called Mount Arbel that towers above the lake. On the northern side, the Jordan River empties its refreshing waters into this 
141 feet deep lake. And from that perspective, to me, the lake looks as if it's in the shape of a heart with the bottom of the heart pointing in the direction of Jerusalem. Seeing the lake at dawn is extra special. It's so peaceful, so serene, especially when you stand at the water's edge and watch the sun come up over the mountains of Lower Golan and see those golden rays reflected on that beautiful blue water. It's one of God's greatest masterpieces. But even more thrilling than the natural beauty of the place is the knowledge of what took place on and near the Sea of Galilee. Sailing across the Sea of Galilee is like stepping back in time where you can easily remember Jesus calming the storm, feeding the 5,000, healing the sick, caring for the needy, and where he called his disciples to become fishers of men. Knowing that it was here that Jesus did and said so many things that changed the world, that changed me, it's one of my favorite places in the world. The Sea of Galilee is beautiful. It's surrounded by towns and settlements. It uh, has cliffs and jutting hilltops that ring its circumference. There are these flat sections with farming. I was struck by the fact that everything about it suggests the beauty, the dramatic, and, and even the dangerous. But I can't imagine being there in the midst of a storm in the lake, big body of water, small wooden boat, no modern lighting at all, and trying to make it to land. But that was the situation in which the apostles found themselves. And yet here is this Jesus who, with a word, can calm the storm and the seas and make sure that they safely reach land. In Jesus' day, that sea was encircled at various points by small towns and communities that they gave him a population to work with, people to teach, people to bless. And I realized that everything that took place in that epicenter, if you will, in northern Israel, those things, those events have the power to shape my life in the 21st century and help me to be more of the character of what Jesus himself was.